Welcome to Energy Stew. This is Peter Roth, your host. I'd like to ask you, has synchronicity been following you in your life? Maybe all your life? Uh-oh, what does that mean? <laughs> Maybe it's, it's been your, all your opportunities. So let's see what we can do with that. And we're going to talk to a man who has lived synchronistically all his life and has written a book about it called God and Love on Route 80, The Hidden Mystery of Human Connectedness. I guess when we're connected, we can be synchronistic. So to help us understand that better is the author of God and Love on Route 80, Stephen Post. Stephen, welcome to Energy Stew. Thank you, Peter. It's a delight to be with you. And also, you're known as the boy. Yes. You're a little older than that, but obviously, <laughs> uh, that's only in time. <laughs> right, which is a hard category to figure out. <laughs> right. But you've, the boy in you is the, the innocent nature that allows synchronicity to work. Okay. Because you're, it's the, as you say in your book, which is an incredible book, I want everybody to just really understand that I'm very excited about having read it and, and the deep meanings in it. And, and so what it is to be an innocent boy is to be open to inner awareness and to allow and what well, what you call and what many of us know as the infinite mind to do its work and you had a vision when you were young and that vision really guided you and still does it still does absolutely so what was that vision well i went up to a boarding school in concord new hampshire it was an episcopal school it was a boys school I guess you'd call it a slightly overpriced orphanage if you wanted, but it was wonderful. Um, uh, I loved the nature. I loved uh, the beautiful architecture. And um, I was very interested in spiritual classics and writings at a fairly young age. So when I was 15, I... Uh, had this recurring dream. It recurred about a half a dozen times over something like a little over a year. I would wake up in the morning, uh, not really awake, but kind of betwixt and between, and I would have this dreamlike experience. I would see this silver gray mist that was really thick, so I couldn't see far ahead of me. I knew it was a road toward the west. And then I looked to my left and I saw a youth, a young man with stringy blonde hair, um, leaning out over a ledge over the sea. Then all the mist disappeared and I saw the face of a blue angel. I wasn't a believer in angels, but there was the face of a blue angel and in a very feminine, soft voice, it said, if you save him, you too shall live. And then I would fully wake up, and, and this dream really caught my attention. We had 8 o'clock uh, chapel service. This is a St. Paul School in New Hampshire every morning. And I used to uh, go early, and I would meditate and reflect on this dream, and I wondered, was it just me cooking this up? Was it just my own desperate search for meaning, or was there something objective to it that was really a call? And I, I didn't quite know, but I spoke about it with a lot of my friends. I spoke about it with my sacred studies teacher, who was a Episcopal priest named Rod Wells. He was a friend of Alan Watts, and. Um, and that dream, because it recurred, I think if it had only come to me once, I would have just put it on the shelf and said, gosh, you know, 
the mind does strange things, but the fact that it recurred uh, and with the same kind of vivid accuracy uh, a half a dozen times really, really struck me. And it struck Rod too. So he was a Yale Divinity School grad and he, he, he took me to Yale uh, to do this class with the Masters of Divinity students. There are people studying for ministry. And you were only a high school student at the time, right? Yeah, I was a high school student. I was, I was 16 at the time. And the teacher there, James Diddy's, Jim Diddy's was a very famous Jungian uh, psychologist, and he really was interested in adolescent spirituality. He didn't write it off. He thought that sometimes it could be very powerful. So I got to talk about my dream in this seminar room full of uh, divinity school students. And, uh, you know, they actually got a little worried because they said, well, what did the dream make you do? What, how did you respond to it? I said, well, among other things, I applied to Reed College in Oregon, and no one from St. Paul's ever applied to Reed College. But I, I did, and, and, and I said, we all read Emerson up there in, in, in Concord, uh, but I was the only one who actually believed in the Oversoul. And we had these beautiful conversations about it. Um, I won't go into the depth of it, but but it was a very formative experience. And then when we drove back that night, you know, north to Concord, I just felt like somehow um, teaching the dream was 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 going to be part of my life's work. Uh huh. And it became that way. <laughs> but you had no idea. And at that point, as I know from your book, you actually didn't follow a direct path. You actually stole off in a stolen car, basically. It was your father's car, but he didn't know you were taking it. Yeah, so my dad, my dad, we, we lived uh, on the south shore of Long Island at the time in West Iceland. My dad had picked up a secondhand gray Mercedes 190. There's a picture of it in the, in the book, by the way. A nice looking car. Yeah, but it had seen better days, and I think he got it so that he could drive me up to St. Paul's and feel that he was sort of, you know, of the aristocracy, which he was sort of not really. And, uh -huh. and so um, he, um, uh, that summer of my 17th year, I was going to Swarthmore, and Rod Wells had got me a job in the Bronx tutoring kids, and I loved doing that because I'd, I'd done it in New Hampshire, mainly with the French Canadians who were these relatively poor families. Most of them were in the wooded areas. And I just really was impressed by, by, by those people and being able to work with them. So I was headed for the Bronx and my mom decided that the Bronx was too dangerous at the time. And uh, we argued about this for at least you know two or three days. And uh, it got pretty serious, pretty heated and finally, uh, um, my mom said, well, I'm not going to cover Swarthmore if you insist on this. So I relented. And I said, now, what am I going to do this summer? And my dad, he was actually the president of a furniture store that no longer exists. It was on Fifth Avenue across from the old Scribner's bookstore area. It's called W&J Sloan's. It's a well-known kind of artsy store. He knew all the uh, manufacturers around greater New York lamps, chairs, tables, whatever. And so he, he sat there and he said, you know, I can get you a job in Bill De Bono's lampshade factory. And in Patchogue, there was a factory. Uh, it had seen better days as well. And I worked there for two weeks. I drove the gray Mercedes 190 to work. It was about a half an hour, 45 minute drive. Uh, my folks had their own car, which they, they, they used. And I worked uh, in this sweltering hot weather because there was no air conditioning between two very, very large, I say this with, with, with respect, Italian women, uh, and I cut cardboard. I just cut cardboard hour after hour after hour. And Bill De Bono would walk by with his big cigar and he'd make sure that we were doing the right work. Um, and so after two weeks, I was finished with the factory. 
And so I drove out to West Hampton Beach, which is a town out a little further east on Long Island. And I had some friends from St. Paul's, Livy Sutro and a couple of people who had places out there. <clears throat> and one Friday night, about 11 o'clock, I said, Libby, I'm, I'm leaving. I had a gal friend named Lee. I said, I'm going west. I'm going to follow my dream. And I don't care about college anymore. I'm just going west. And so they were a little bit taken. I had my classical guitar. I had a copy of Siddhartha. Um, I had about 50 bucks in my wallet. Um, and I just drove west on the Sunrise Highway. And I actually took the southern state. I drove through the Midtown Tunnel. And I eventually got up over the George Washington Bridge. I'd never driven west of the bridge, so I didn't know what was out there. But there were very quickly, there were two signs. One said 95 South. Well, there was no South in the dream. And the other said <laughs> Route 80 West. So I said, well, that's me. And I just drove west and, and about five in the morning, I started to come to my senses, you could say. Uh, about five in the morning, I'm smack dab in the middle of Pennsylvania, uh, near the Lewisburg exit, um, but there's no phone booths or anything around. I'm thinking about turning around. I was really seriously thinking, you know, if I do a U-turn here over the midway, I can get home, um, and I got enough money for gas to do that, and my reputation will be intact. Uh, but amazingly, just as I was seriously thinking about this, cars back in those days had generators. And when the generators broke, again, this car had seen better days, um, <clears throat> the whole thing went dead. I mean, the, all the lights were out, the engine was out, and the best I could do was to get on the right shoulder. And I just barely did that without getting killed. And I got out of the car and I looked around and, you know, there were, first of all, miles and miles and miles of wheat fields, some corn fields. There was nothing at all. Um, this, the, the dawn is just beginning to break. And so I didn't know what to do. The only thing I could do was what I did. I reached in the glove compartment, took out a piece of paper, and I wrote in pencil a little note that has lived in my family legacy in some infamy. <laughs> and it said, to the Pennsylvania State Police, please return this car to Henry A. V. Post, 44 Davison Lane East, West Islip, New York, 516-669-5655, from his son, who no longer works in the lampshade factory. That was terrible. <laughs> that was terrible. And <clears throat> so I got my guitar, my Siddhartha, uh, you know, and I stuck my thumb out in a big, immediately, in like within two seconds, a big, huge truck came zooming by, pulled up, a guy flung open the white door, and he said, where are you going? I said, West. He said, well, I can get you to Chicago. My name's Gary. He was dressing in country and Western. And uh, we had a really delightful trip. Uh, uh, we got it. He actually dropped me off at Grant Park in downtown Chicago. And, um, and I was off. And I always thought that when the car broke down like that, you know, it was a message from the universe that I was really supposed to take this trip to the West, you know. I it, it, it's so interesting to me because your book talks about what happened in Chicago and it was fascinating the opportunities that you had and only for a while because you wanted to keep going west well that was great I mean actually it was kind of a kind of a protest period so there were a lot of people around Grant Park Grant Park's out near the the Chicago Art Institute and I was playing Via Lobos and Granados and Tarrega on my classical guitar. I was making a pretty good amount of money. Uh, and I fell in with a van full of hippies who were camping out there. And I said, so where are you going? They said, well, San Francisco. And I said, well, that's West, so I'll go with you if it's okay. <laughs> and they said, fine. The amazing thing was that we got to uh, Nebraska. Now, Route 80, 
you know, goes from the George Washington Bridge all the way to San Francisco. And um, it goes through Nebraska, we go through Omaha. And then we got to Lincoln, Nebraska, and there was uh, a spate of phone booths on the right. There was a stop area. One of the gals in the, in the van said to me, you know, you really ought to call your mom. So I said, all right, I'll call my mom. So we got out and I called Collect. And uh, my mom, she said, Stevie, thank God you're alive. We can call off the Pinkertons. <laughs> and I said, verbatim, mom, why did you call the Pinkertons? Didn't you get my note? <laughs> And she said, actually, they had gotten a call from the Pennsylvania State Police, and they had had the car towed, and it was in a garage on Long Island. And 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 they and my mom said, you know, we really should have let you tutor in the Bronx. And I said, I think so too. It would have been fine. <laughs> but I said, Mom, maybe this all worked out because that car has seen better days, and maybe the generator would have let go, and you and Dad would have been driving, and you'd have been seriously injured. But with me, I got it on the right shoulder. And so she said, well, now, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm heading out west. And she said, well, where are you going to stay? And she actually gave me the address of my cousin, George Lamont, who had done two tours of duty in the Green Berets. He was a Chapel Hill graduate in Chinese studies, and he was part of that Vietnam vet subculture in the Mission District. So I got out to George's, 4 Chenery Street, uh, slept on his floor. I knew him just somewhat. And I joined uh, Nichiren Shoshu Nam Yoho Renge Kyo Buddhist Temple that was on the corner of Chenery and Market. And I chanted with those beads and I lost all sense of time and place. And I didn't think I ever needed to go to college because I could just capture universal knowledge somehow intuitively. And I played classical guitar in the Hispanic restaurants, and I did really well. And I had an old uh, Japanese American named Gus, who was like my mentor, and he'd he'd been interned during the during the war in Hawaii. So he was great. But I drew a bad number in the in the draft. They had the bins with your birth dates in them at the time. So I called the people at Reed College, even though I turned them down, and I said, "Look." Uh, I'm not totally against all wars, I suppose, but this is not my kind of war. So they immediately opened up a spot for me. Which kept you out of the of the draft. Kept me out of the draft, and, and they were nice enough to do that. And one morning, early September, about 7 in the morning, I was in front of the temple, and I was with Gus and George, and they gave me, I had to pay some money for it, but they gave me this really special Japanese scroll it's called a Gahon Zone. And it's like, it's about, you know, this long and, and it's got these beautiful Japanese symbols on it that are all spiritual about universal mind uh, and, 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 and ultimate reality and such things. And um, so they explained that to me and then I put it in my backpack. I took the Market Street bus, which got me to Golden Gate Park and I walked across the park, which is, a, you know, it's a good 15, 20 minute walk. And then I, I walked up on the bridge because I'm headed north to Oregon. And it's silvery gray mist. I, I really couldn't see more than about maybe three or four feet in front of my, my nose. Uh, and I'm on the left side of the bridge. And there's a walkway, this kind of red walkway. And then there's a, there's a railing that's about waist high. Um, and I get to the middle of the bridge and I hear a little ruffling sound to my left. And I looked over and there was a rail and there was a young guy with stringy blonde hair leaning out and he looked like he was going to jump. And I just kind of froze and I said very peacefully and, and, and really quite empathically to him, I said, I really, truly hope you're not planning to jump. And he was indignant. I mean, the guy was, he was so mad that I had sort of interrupted his moment that uh, he started screaming out um, lines from Macbeth about empty nothingness. And I, and I said, you know, I, I actually agree with you. I'm, I'm, a, I'm on a, you could say I'm on a desperate detour for meaning myself. And 
there's not that much difference. I'm over here, you're over there on the ledge. Um, but um, let me just uh, tell you something that I think I may have been guided all the way to this very moment, this very spot, at this very time, because of a dream that I had 3,000 miles away and two years earlier. Okay? So he said, tell me about it. And I, I, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I told him that, look, I had this dream. I told him about the dream. I told him about going to Yale. I, I, I told him about the fight with my parents. I told him about leaving the car uh, on Route 90 near the Lewisburg exit. I told him about calling mom from Lincoln, Nebraska. I told him about the draft thing. I told him about everything. And he said, you know, you're really pretty crazy to do that. And I said, well, all right. And we, we, had a, we actually had a decent conversation. And, and then toward the end of it, I said, look, um, I have something that can change your life. And if, you, if I give it to you, it's going to give you good luck from here on out. So he said, what is it? I said, it's a cajon zone. And I can explain it to you. And I pulled it out of my backpack. And he was, again, indignant. And I said, look, if you step over the railing and you stand here next to me, I'm going to explain this to you. And, I, and he actually, shockingly, he actually did come over the railing and he stood there next to me. We introduced ourselves. Um, he was named Harry. And I explained the symbols, like, you know, the, the heart with the line through it was the Japanese symbol for for busy, no heart. And there were other things that were really interesting about it. And I said, I'm going to give this to you, uh, but you have to do me a favor. You have to make a promise. And the promise is you have to go you know, south on the bridge, walk across the park, get the Market Street bus. And I gave him a note to Cousin George. Cousin George, this is Harry. He needs a shower. Please let him sleep on your floor where I slept. Take him to the Buddhist temple, let him meet Gus, and look after him. And um, so I didn't know what would happen to Harry, but I went uh, north on the bridge, and he went south. And I felt, just because of that encounter, which was so uncanny and just so beyond anything I could ever imagine. I mean, if you were, a, I guess if you were a statistician, I'm surrounded by statisticians <laughs> in this medical school, of course. Now, you would say that some time in the history of the great universe, on the basis of pure probability and chance, you know, pure luck, I guess, this encounter was going to happen. But for me, it was so closely resonant with the dream and the images in the dream. As I was walking uh, north on the bridge, the, the mist evaporated. Suddenly, there was some sun and some blue. And I felt like uh, for the first time, I really understood that the dream I'd had at St. Paul's when I was 15, it wasn't just my adolescent imagination working overtime, which I thought it might have been. I mean, I, I, I was open-minded about that. <clears throat> but um, it really meant something. And uh, so I got to the end of the bridge. I stuck my thumb out and Right away, there was a truck, just a farmer's truck that came by. I'll never forget this. There's a guy flung the door open, and he said, where are you going? And I said, Oregon. <clears throat> he said, well, we can get you most of the way. <clears throat> Jump in. My name's Dwayne Dill, D-I-L-L, -L, just like in Dill Pickle. <clears throat> and this here's my wife, Dorothy, who was a red-haired woman. <clears throat> and she said, hi. And I got in the truck, and... Uh, you know, that was my first big episode in the book of what I felt was, was uh, this kind of divine synchronicity. And it, it, it conveyed a lot to me. And I, 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 I did not see Harry again, but I came back from Reed <clears throat> for Thanksgiving to Cousin George's place. Um, and uh, it turns out that, you know, uh, Harry had gone back home to North Carolina with a gal friend. Uh, and I never saw Harry again, and so I, you know, I can't connect that dot, but um, to me, uh, it was a really profound, moving experience, and that's why 
you know, the subtitle of the book, The Mystery of Human Connectedness, that somehow I was supposed to meet him when I, when I met him. Well, now your life <laughs> became uh, also uh, a result of that prophecy, save him and you too will be saved. So we're really getting to the end of the show. And I want to continue this because it's fascinating. These, there's so many stories in your book and, and who you turned into is this incredible humanitarian who is helping to heal the world in powerful ways. And I want to talk more about how synchronistic your life was and, and I'm sure still is and how that can help our audience appreciate their own paths and to be also be open to being taken care of in life in ways that we have no idea and can't even imagine how miraculous it can be. Yeah, we're really cherished and sometimes we, we don't notice it. Larry Dossi wrote a foreword to, what, to God and Love on Route 80 and he uses the word noticer. You need to notice the, these, these. You're aware, actions. right? Watch the ser the serendipity and synchronicity happening, and yeah. I've become a great witness of that. That's why I'm so fascinated about your journey because it really speaks to me, and I'm sure a lot to our audience. So um, hopefully, we'll do another show soon. Uh, your book is God and Love on Route 80. Stephen Post, S T E P H E N, uh, the hidden mystery of human connectedness. And is there a website? <clears throat> yeah, the best website's really uh, Stephen with a PH, gpost.com. But there's also an institute that I founded with Sir John Templeton, which is a whole synchronicity in itself, called unlimitedloveinstitute.org. Great. And we're going to talk a lot more about unlimited, unlimited love yeah. coming up. So, Stephen, thanks so much for being a guest on Energy Stew. Thank you, Peter, and thanks to all your listeners. Appreciate it greatly. Well, I'm so glad they're there. Yeah. And this is Peter Roth, your host of Energy Stew at PRN.FM. I can be reached at Peter at Heart River, H E A R T River.org. I'd love to hear from you, and thanks so much for listening.